Well, Britt, thank you so much for helping my project. Could you say a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Britt Adkins, and um, I am the founder of Celestial Citizen, which just launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's a platform for discussion about our future in space, as well as our future on Earth, and um, you know, using urban planning principles and public participation to um, to drive us forward towards a more just and equitable future, um, both here at home and also um, as we venture out into space. And I'm also currently a graduate student at the Colorado School of Mines, getting my master's of space resources degree. Um, and I'm actually duly enrolled with um, the University of Southern California, which is where I'm physically located. And I'm getting my master's of urban planning degree there. Prior to that, I had an architecture and planning background in undergrad and um, have worked in a whole host of different fields. Um, but I'm now very, very passionate about um, space settlement in the future and what we have to do to, to figure out how to do that in a, in a way that uh, is, is much better than what we've managed to do here on Earth. So, um, so urban planning, that's uh, kind of probably new for a lot of people. I know we, many of us live in cities, but I don't think we really understand how the planning goes about to, to do the cities. Can you... Can you maybe give us a highlight of some of those uh, principles that you think are most relevant? Yeah, yeah. So, and it's it's really interesting because I think when you look at urban planning history as well, you kind of realize that there have been many different ways that people have tried to go about doing this, some uh, unsuccessfully and some more successful than others. I think um, that in terms of, uh, in terms of like the planning style that I'm most um, appreciate and sort of um, think is the right way to, to move forward is actually um, is more of a participatory method to planning. Um, so where you're really um, operating at almost a grassroots level, trying to talk to the public, understanding what they want for their communities, um, and then trying to um, trying to basically just facilitate um, the decisions that people are making for themselves with still, you know, guiding people towards, you know, um, understanding, you know, these are your, your range of options and this is like the potential implications of, of what um, those decisions might, might lead to. And so kind of just helping people, I guess, understand the longer term picture. Um, one of the planners that I've always been really influenced by is Kevin Lynch. Um, and he was one of the early uh, planners to really, um, to really promote this idea of public participation in planning. And certainly there have been countless others since then. Um, but I think that for me and how I'm thinking about um, trying to apply this to space, I think the most critical thing is just including the general public in that conversation. So making sure that, um, that we have you know, more town hall style events where people can ask questions of, um, of folks at NASA and understand what their different um, missions are gonna be doing, aiming to do, allow the public to actually be heard in terms of like what, what areas of space research and exploration they really particularly value. Um, I think right now that's just, we're relying a little too heavily on that being done um, you know, at, at the constituent level. And I'm just not sure that that's quite as successful. I don't think that a lot of people still understand exactly, um, exactly what's getting um, approved. And I think, I think if we had more public participation, we'd have a lot more public interest as well, which I think is good for everybody. Um, but back to your question about urban planning. So urban planning essentially is looking at like the, the social, the economic, the political aspects um, that go into the way a city is designed. Um, so you might have some people that are focused um, very specific, like urban designers are very focused on the, the architecture, the design, the, the layout um, of a city. And, um, and then urban planners are sort of, they're more focused on a lot of these sort of like social considerations and issues. And so they really have to wear a lot of different policy hats um, as well, as well as understanding obviously like the design and the choices made there as well. And, and even within that, you know, urban planning has changed so much over the years. So it used to, um, you know, starting with like the City Beautiful movement, it used to be really um, more of like an architectural bird's eye view down of a city um, and then not really focusing as much on some of like the problems 
uh, that existed already in the city or that might in turn exist because of the design choices made, right? Like it's a very, you have a lot of, um, at least historically, you've had like a lot of power as a planner to shape, you know, what people's lives would be like. In the case of City Beautiful, a lot of those people did not, um, and they didn't actually even plan for um, the housing for the working class, which is just like a massive oversight, but it kind of shows that it was done at, at too high of a level. It was a lot of elitist um, individuals that were thinking they knew best for the entire city. So I think like that's the key takeaway here for urban planning now as we as we move forward from present day on forward is that um, urban planning is not some sort of predicting of the future. It's not one person's vision. It's really, um, I think if you're doing it right, it's sort of trying to um, collect all the different opinions, all the different voices of a community, trying to give um, equal weight to those voices and making sure that everybody gets heard in the, you know, in the decision of, you know, how we, how we move forward. And I also think it's trying to encourage people to, um, you know, I think uh, there's, there's a planner at, at MIT, um, Carlo Rotti, in his book, he makes this great point about future craft and this idea that there's like these little, um, you know, sort of hacks that can be done and, and that like ultimately there's this citizen hacking of the city that kind of makes these little mutations along the way and that's what leads to your, your real future. And so I think having that mindset where we just think about all the little things we can do to move the needle towards positive change, that in my opinion is what urban planning is. Yeah, and you know, I think a part of the challenge is that uh, the vast majority of cities uh, don't start out as planned areas. They, they start out organically, you know, somebody moves someplace and then somebody else moves closer to them and then suddenly they create like a, you know, water treatment plan or, or something and then you know, it, it's it. In terms of all the cities in the world, which one do you think has it done right? <laughs> you had, do you have a, a poster a poster city? Oh, yeah. I mean, honestly, um, I, you know, I don't think that there is any one particular city that has done it right. Um, completely. And I think that that's okay, because that's another thing, um, you know, not to go back to Lynch, but there, that's another thing that Lynch talks about is this learning ecology and this idea that we have to adapt and grow and learn as we, um, as we sort of plan our cities. Now, I do also want to go back to though your original point, which is that in some cases, there have actually been cities you know, that have been essentially like master plan from the get go. And, um, you know, I guess two big examples that come to mind immediately for me are like Brasilia and Chandigarh. And, um, and so those, I think, are interesting examples for us to look at in terms of, um, in terms of, you know, kind of like this, this, this blank slate kind of like master plan community. Um, but you're right, most, most cities that we see today had some sort of organic process to them. Um, I'd say that in the US though, there, there have been also a handful of, um, of master plan communities, maybe not cities, but master plan communities. So, I mean, the, I think that there have been some notable examples that we can look to. Um, I think unfortunately, when you get into the territory of like people thinking about blank slate cities, that's where people start to project their sort of like utopian ideas onto those um, cities, which I think, is something that we really need to make sure that we're careful of in space because I've already seen that quite a bit. Um, I've seen that going to conferences and things like that, where um, there will be, you know, even like well, well-meaning, you know, well-intentioned um, contests where it's like, okay, design a, you know, um, a Mars colony. Which, like, why are we calling it a Mars colony? You know, like that's like we should be aiming to to try to make this process come you know as as decolonized as possible for for um humans moving to another um planet where essentially like you know in there's no way around it right we that very act is is us um you know sort of acting as as though we're colonizing it but it's like we need to really be a lot more thoughtful and so i think um and so i i think that's one thing where i've seen these ideas that people are coming out with they're really like these utopian Kind of ideals and I also think that there's a fair amount of like um, 
belief in sacrifice as though like, well, you know, we're okay if, you know, the first settlers go and they might all die or most of them might die and that's okay because that's what happened, you know, hundreds of years ago. And it's just that to me, that mentality, I think is like, is, is not, it's not, it's not okay anymore. And I think that we need to really be thinking about um, these, these cities should not be built on, like, we shouldn't be modeling them after like this colony model that we've known. Like it needs to, we've certainly progressed, you know, technologically we, we've progressed so much. I'm not sure why the social aspect, you know, has to still be so stuck in the past. And I don't think that it does. So Anyway, that's a side note about, you know, kind of like the blank slate cities. And then in terms of like a, a great model here on, on earth, I mean, I think we just have to pull from a lot of different aspects of different cities. I don't think that there's any one complete model that's going to really prove out um, exactly, you know, how we want a city to be. And frankly, I think it's learning from all those different individual lessons that will make it more successful in the future too. Um, you know, I think we need to make sure that we're trying to, to have a, um, you know, a, a lunar or Martian, um, and, and, you know, a city is obviously very forward looking. I think initially probably like a base is, um, is more reasonable, but there's, there's no reason why we can't have an urban planning mindset from the beginning there. And I think if we, if we focus on trying to make sure that it's as sustainable as possible, our impact is as low as possible to, to this you know, new environment that we're going to be in, um, that we have the right institutions in place to, to protect people, protect workers. Um, the, I mean, the workforce dynamics are going to be um, you know, pretty wild to start. I mean, I don't know if you've read the book Artemis, um, but you know, there's, um, even though it's, it's a fictional account, I mean, I think it really does highlight some, some real uh, concerns and issues that we need to think about. And also just making sure that the, the first you know, group of people that are living and working in space are a diverse representative group of people, not only from the US, but across like the whole, uh, the whole world. We need to make sure that this is really a global community, a global effort, um, and, and even also you know, thinking about resources. Um, resources historically have been like the source of so much geopolitical con uh, conflict that we really need to think about how we can do a better job of that um, in a way that still does not, um, you know, completely close the door on us being able to go. I mean, I think, I think that there's a great opportunity there to live, live off the land in a more sustainable, hopefully very low impact way. Um, but we also need to make sure that um, the way that we're handling resources is, is equitable. Um, you know, for for all the different um, you know countries that want to that want to be there, um, either today or in the future. Maybe they just don't have the capability to get there right away. But that doesn't mean they should be closed off from that opportunity. So, um, so I think there's lots of lots of things that we can pull from terrestrial examples. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, it would be great if there was like one city that I was like, this one's the one. But I just I don't think that there is. Um, have you done any? Uh, looking into like the intentional community movement where you have like groups of people that intentionally form uh, kind of like a community. Uh, some of them are, you know, maybe uh, focus around some ecological principles, or religious uh, thoughts are, um, but it, you know, it's not just a, a group of people that just happen to cohabitate near each other, uh, sharing a set of services, but something that's more akin to a community. I was uh, wondering if what you thought about that. So it's funny you bring that up because actually there's um there's a documentary that I forget the name about that I've been wanting to watch, which kind of like um I think dives into that a little bit. You know, I have so I personally have not studied a lot on that topic. I think I took one class in undergrad that was focused on um, you know, on and sort of like religions that um you know often found themselves at conflict with um the, the u.s legal system which was quite interesting um but you know i think at least as i see it and 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 the work that i you know am, am trying to plan for i don't want anything to um i want it to be very open and i think like what concerns me is everybody should have the right to, to do and, and organize as they see fit, of course, as long as they're not, you know, in, 
infringing upon the rights of anybody else. Um, you know, but I think, um, but I also think that like as a planner, my job and my my sort of calling is to try to bring as many different groups of people together to peacefully coexist as possible. So, you know, when we when we think about these sort of like closed off communities where they're just specific to like one religion or one sort of mindset, I do think that that's unfortunately, um, you know, a bit of a disservice to the to the global community um, only because you know, it is, um, you know, kind of by definition exclusive. So, um, so it's not, I mean, again, I, I think that um, it's something we talk about in urban planning actually a lot is how do you both plan for the collective, but you also preserve individual identity as well. Um, because sometimes, especially in the case of, um, you know, different minority groups, it's important to have um, safe spaces um, and, and places where people feel like they are free from oppression to practice their religion, to be themselves, their, you know, their sexuality, their identity, like all those different things. It is important for them to have safe spaces. Um, but I would like to figure out a way to include those people in this broader vision of, you know, where, um, where we do just have this global community. So how can we maybe make sure that those people feel safe and protected to do and believe as they see fit, but still, still live within, um, you know, within this particular community of, uh, you know, of representatives of earth, I guess. Yeah, and, you know, especially one thing that is true with urban planning, probably, and will be true with space is the idea of, um, you know, balancing the people that were there first and the people that came later, and then the people mm -hmm. that came later after that. I, I mean, like you mentioned, people should have freedom up to the time that they interfere with other people. Mm -hmm. um, and the fewer people that there are around, the less there are to interfere with. So naturally, as you add more and more people into the city, the people that were there originally, their rights are actually kind of shrinking in a way uh, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have less less space. And then at some point, you know, maybe the dominant character of the city actually changes and uh, it seems kind of alien to the people that were there at first. And this mm -hmm. creates all sorts of negative social interactions and uh, what have you. I, I mean, how do you how do you navigate kind of like these natural conflicts that occur in a way that everybody feels the better for it at the end of it? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because um, you know you're you're absolutely right. Like initially, right? There's so many phases to this because initially, like the first people that go and live and work up there, you know, they'll be there, you know, for longer duration stays, but they're not going to be there you know, the first group that goes to live and work on the moon is not gonna be there permanently. Um, and so I think like, it, and, and I certainly don't wanna get in the game of um, projecting, like, you know, we're trying to predict how many years out until it's, you know, um, people are being, you know, uh, you know, full-term like, you know, residents or, um, or even starting to have children. I think that there's so many biological aspects of this to figure out. Um, so, you know, obviously like even with the moon, right, the radiation, um, exposure of living on the surface is just, um, it does, it's not conducive to keeping people there for, um, you know, super long extended periods of time. And, you know, while there are some ways to kind of like think about doing that, I know some people are, are looking into, you know, could we live in lava tubes and be shielded from the radiation? Um, you know, other people are, you know, wonder if perhaps an orbiting space station and, um, you know, around the moon would be, would be better um, from a biological perspective. You know, I don't know. There's, there's lots of different ways, I think, to think about this. I think probably as time goes on, I think that we will have technological advances that allow us um, as humans to, you know, adapt ourselves to these environments. I think that's definitely coming. Um, and, and probably sooner than we think, right? We're, all, we're already kind of, um, either, whether it's intentional or not, we're already sort of like adapting ourselves just based on the choices we make um, and what we eat and what we put in our bodies. So I think that over time, I think that that will definitely get there. I think that, um, I think that by the time we're, you know, thinking about like actually having, um, you know, the first humans born on the moon or born on Mars. I think that's very far, far out still. Um, 
only because that's just like an area that quite frankly, like we haven't fully figured out how to do safely here on earth. Um, so I feel like it's, uh, we, we've got a lot of work to do there. The good news is, is that like, as we work to these problems, right, I, the hope is, is that the more we study this, the more we understand the human body and how it responds to different environments. Hopefully we also figure out ways to, you know, improve the quality of life for people here on earth. So I think that's a real exciting opportunity. Um, but in terms of balancing out, you know, the different interests, I think you're absolutely right. I think it's going to be um, a very steep learning curve because you're going to have people that initially get there. And even though we talk about a sustainable presence on the moon, a sustainable presence on Mars, right? You have people whose, whose entire mentality is tied to earth-based institutions, right? And so that is their, their framework of thinking. And then as that starts to evolve over time, right? Like they even talk about, um, oh gosh, it, it, there's, um, it, I, maybe it was in the overview effect. I was reading this now, I can't remember which book I read it in, but it was like this idea that the further you get away from earth, right? The more your psychology changes, the, the, the harder it is to kind of like connect back to those. So I think that the way that a moon city would operate is going to be very different from how a Mars city will operate just based on where they exist in the in the solar system and I think we need to start thinking about that I think this, the psychological aspects um, are, are huge in all of this and so and then I think you know as you point out once we have people that um, you know they're the, the first humans that were born on that planet they're going to feel a completely different sense of identity um, I think that there's probably going to be more of a sense of like, um, you know, like almost territorialism, like this is my, my home, my planet, this is where I was born, similar to, as to how we might feel about Earth, right? So I think that these changes will definitely um, occur and it's, it's going to be tough to navigate, which is all the more reason, you know, to include planners in this, in this process where, you know, um, there's, planners have definitely been flawed in the past. I'm not going to say that it's been a perfect profession by any means. Um, but I think that, you know, at least I feel very hopeful in that, you know, in my program at USC, there's really, the education is much more focused on, um, you know, how can we balance interests in way, and talk about things in ways that we never had before. You know, when I, urban planning has just already changed so much in the last decade. And, and I'm really excited by the changes that I see and, and where it's going. And so I think, um, I think that we just need people that are really focused on those social issues. And unfortunately in the space industry, there are certainly some people that are, but it is not the driving force. Um, and it, it just, it needs to have more of a seat at the table. Like we're talking about things now that um, some of the decisions we make will not be easily undone. So it now is definitely the time, whether you think that a city on the moon or Mars is 50 or 100 years into the future, it doesn't really matter because now is definitely the time to lay the groundwork for some of those institutions. You know, I, I just think uh, here on Earth, if we look at Boca Chica Village and SpaceX uh, mm -hmm. as an example, I mean, I'm a big SpaceX fanboy and, you know, the SN8 and SN9 uh, launches that's uh, imminent is like something I, I'm looking forward to uh, with eagerness and but at the same token, you know, that came at a, a social cost, right? Um, you had these retirees who bought what they thought would be a nice retirement place uh, on the, the Gulf of Mexico and, you know, SpaceX moves uh, next door and they have to move out and, um, you know, they were compensated, but on the other hand, you know, where would they go? You know, obviously they're going to be living next to different people. Um, you know, uh, at that, when you get around a retirement, you're looking at stability and uh, not not having to get up and move and make new connections and things like that. Um, I mean, how f familiar are you with sort of that that situation down there in Boca Chica? And and based upon what you are familiar with, um, how do you think it could have gone better? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so actually, the, um, the Boca Chica example is like one that I am very interested in actually like, personally, like researching a little bit more, um, talking to people um, from the area that have been displaced. 
Um, it's, it's actually, it's funny you mentioned that because that's like one of the projects that I'm hoping to do uh, before my graduate program's up. Um, and so I think, you know, it, I think that we just have to understand that there, like, this is not the first example in history of infrastructure, new infrastructure, displacing people. Um, you know, historically, we saw that with, you know, the automobile boom and, um, and just like the massive, uh, you know, construction of new highway systems and things like that, displacing minority groups. Um, and it's, it's interesting to me because I don't know how we as a society ever sort of got comfortable with this idea that infrastructure was more important than the people that were there to start. Um, and so I think that's something that unfortunately with Boca Chica, um, and I don't wanna like rush any judgments because I have not personally interviewed anybody down there. I'm not, you know, done the digging in that I would like to, but at least on the surface, it does concern me um, that as you said, you know, people um, I, I've read articles and, you know, seen anecdotal stories about people being displaced and yeah, of course, yeah, they're getting compensated. But as you point out, like, where are they going to go? And that's not always, that's still not always like a very fair process as we've seen before, you know, it's, um, you can't, you know, the, it's like, it's also the, it's, I mean, it's a very big problem that we talk about in planning is gentrification, like people just getting pushed out of the areas that they have been from. And we just, as a society, I just feel like we don't seem to have as much, you know, we just don't seem to take as much issue with that. And I'm, I'm guessing that a big component of that is probably a lot of people just don't even understand like the implications of what it is that they're doing. Um, you know, I think that, you know, Elon Musk is like very focused, I think on, on his vision. I think also like I think every, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm an optimist, but I think that most humans actually feel like in their heart of hearts, like they're doing the most important thing, you know, for society, that they're doing what they feel like is, is the right thing to do. Um, and so I think for him, he's just so focused on making humans an interplanetary species and like providing that infrastructure. You know, I don't, obviously I don't, you know, he doesn't have an urban planning background. He, um, I, you know, I don't think has ever worked in like a social field, right? And so I think ultimately it probably doesn't occur to him that like displacing these people, even if compensated, is still a really uh, damaging thing to do. I mean, it, com I mean it, co it completely destroys communities to just displace groups like this. Um, so I don't know that he's even necessarily really thought of that. Um, maybe he has, but you know, I think, and I think it's the same way when like, you know, families move into areas where they think, well, oh, I'm going to move in and I'm going to uh, renovate this house and I'm going to, you know, because I'm going to get a deal because I'm going to move into this new and up and coming neighborhood and renovate this house. And isn't that a great thing to do? But it, it's actually not because you're, you know, you're, you're basically, um, if you're doing that in the community where people are then being pushed out, you're taking away an opportunity um, you know, for somebody to have housing there. So I, you know, again, I, I like to, I like to assume the best in people until proven otherwise, but, you know, I think that ultimately there just needs to be more of a thoughtfulness around that. I would love to see SpaceX take more of a proactive approach in terms of, you know, understanding that they are a provider of infrastructure. So, you know, therefore as many providers of infrastructure here on earth would be, they need to be involved in some some more planning discussions that kind of could handle this differently. And frankly, they're not the only ones. I mean, Boca Chica is a great example, but there's also the, you know, the, the proposed UK spaceport um, that's been met with a lot of controversy. And I think just in general, I'm very interested in seeing how some of these spaceports um, are handled. Houston, for example, is a spaceport that's going to be in like a fairly urban environment. Um, and so to me, I think this is, this is not just like middle of nowhere, you know, New Mexico or something like that. I mean, this is like spaceports are going to start popping up, you know, in and around our cities. And how do we, how do we handle that? How do we handle the consequences of all of these, you know, launches, both impact the environment and impact to these individual communities? And I'm not saying we don't, you know, I'm not saying, oh, stop, like, let's not do any of this. I'm just saying we need to be more thoughtful about it. Um, and I, I think that that would, um, I think there's, 
you know, we can, we can find the right solutions um, to where we can lower our impact, um, you know, both socially and environmentally. So, hope, you know, that's, that's kind of my hope. Yeah, and I'm sure uh, in Elon's mind, even if he was thinking about it, um, you know, on one hand, he has displacing 100 people who receive compensation for their property versus the survival of the human species, you know, that's like, uh, yeah. kind of the way that uh, he looks at it. And, you know, the, the 100 people aren't going to ever come out favorable in, in such an analysis. Um, True. The only thing I would say, though, is that, you know, at least no estimates that I've seen have predicted that the species is going to, you know, we're not at that, you know, existential, you know, um, we're, you know, we're dying out and it's, ha- it's going to happen in our lifetime. You know, our biggest threat right now, at least in my opinion, is, um, you know, climate change and, and global warming. And so I think that, like, if we're actually going to talk about, you know, what I think is like the, the biggest threat to us right now as a society, um, that is certainly, at least, you know, in my opinion, that's the number one thing. And so I think when we talk about you know, I think when we talk about, okay, yes, but like eventually, like if we don't become interplanetary, like eventually, like we're going to die out, you know, for, um, you know, whether they be natural causes or whether like an asteroid comes and hits us, like all these different things, right? Completely agree, completely agree that we want to diversify the human presence a- across, you know, um, you know, other, other host planets. But at the same time, you know, I just, I still, my mindset is that that is still, we can be working towards that goal, but that's not like an immediate near term, it's happening in our lifetime thing. But what is happening in our lifetime is like, you know, these people that are being displaced. So I, I place more value, I guess, on, um, on the people here today. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think it's great to be thinking about the future and, and, you know, making humans interplanetary but i just i still just think that that's like that is never in my opinion going to be enough to sort of like compensate for what we're doing to people here on this planet and i think also like with um you know again i mean we're already seeing um from climate change we're already seeing people that are effectively climate refugees moving um you know in having to change location because their homes have been destroyed um, and, and I think that, you know, if we're really going to talk about like, what is the existential threat to our society right now? I mean, that, that is it, um, to which again, you know, we, we have to be just mindful of balancing our space exploration objectives with that as well. And I think the two, I mean, I think they're not mutually exclusive. I think that there's, um, I think there's a lot of value to be gained from, um, from making space a little bit more intersectional, you know? It's just I think we can't, I think people can't be scared to um, can't be scared to like have those conversations because I think I think right now it's like there's a lot of concern that it would just it would make the industry's wheel stop and I I don't think that, that I don't think that that would be true I think that there would be a lot of overlap and advantage gained um, and also it's just the right thing to do, you know, like let's use space technology. Let's use what we're doing in space to make life better here on earth. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, how do we live in spaceship earth? Maybe we start out with uh, a real spaceship and figure out how we make that work and then kind of take those lessons and drive them back. Um, you, you talked about uh, in terms of like the moon, for example, we have like China, um, the US, Russia, able to access the surface of the moon today. And they're not able to actually, according to treaties they sign, claim any of that territory for themselves. But you can see at some point them wanting to have mining operations and doing other development activities. And I think they could probably figure out something that will work between themselves because they're all there and they'll need to make sure they stay out of each other's area. The, the rights that are a little bit harder to kind of deal with are the people that can access the moon, but may want to at some point in the future, or at least doesn't want to get closed off, like you were saying earlier. Um, how do you keep, how do you uh, allow for that without, you know, making that be a complete stop 
of anything that we're doing. You know, how do you keep that from being an obstruction? Why at the same time taking into account? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I've um, I've taken, you know, a, a space law class, by no means an expert, um, very much still, a, you know, an amateur in that field. But I think it did at least get my feet wet to sort of like the um, complexity of just international law, that whole mindset. Um, I think, I think you bring up a great point. It's something I've been kind of like noodling on for a little bit, you know, thinking about, okay, how do we, how do we structure things in such a way that like, you know, by the time some of these more emerging space agencies are able to get there every, you know, the resources are not either, um, you know, the resources aren't going to be gone, but like, it's, you know, but like people often talk about this so they're like, oh, there's plenty for everyone. Well, but also though, like the access to them and like the infrastructure and like all of that, like it's, it's quite likely that the first, you know, space agencies that, that get to the moon that are able to um, set up shop that they're going to choose the most desirable, easy to access locations in order to extract those resources, right? As, as is logical. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great question. I don't know that I don't have a great answer at this time. Um, I think it's something that a lot of, obviously people are thinking about, a lot of people with law and you know policy backgrounds, um, specifically in the area of, you know, of you know, resources and resource extraction. So, it's an area I definitely want to follow really closely. I think that, you know, again, like putting on my urban planner hat, I think that the most important thing is that we're actually talking to and listening to um, these emerging space agencies to hear what they want and how we can support them. Um, and whether, you know, that's just more, uh, you know, cross collaboration, um, some joint, you know, missions, joint projects, things like that. I think there's a lot of things that we could be doing um, to to involve uh, those space agencies a lot more in what's happening today. And it's ultimately, I think it's beneficial to everyone because it's a good, um, it's, it's great um, exposure for some of these like earlier agencies, uh, but at the same time, like for the more, um, you know, like the US and other agencies that have been around for a long time, you know, you, you also have the ability to get that like outsider perspective and you have this, you know, sort of like new fresh um, perspective that could be added to your, your mission as well, which I think is really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think, um, and I, I know that there's like coming up the, the Space Generation Advisory Council, they're um, actually putting on a workshop, which I'm trying to see if I have like the official name on this, um, but it's, uh, but effectively the workshop, let me see if I can pull it up here. Yeah, so it's, it's the, it's the uh, fourth Africa Space Generation Workshop um, at Space Generation Advisory Council. And that's coming up in March of next year. Um, and I was actually talking with, uh, you know, a couple of the um, organizers of the event just a couple of days ago. And like, I mean, it is gonna be a fascinating event. It's gonna be a really interesting workshop. They have lined up some great, speakers and um, and different uh, topics for, you know, the case studies and things like that at the workshop. So that's something that I think is going to be really great to watch. They're actually doing a crowdfunding campaign right now too. So, um, so you know, if you have like five, ten dollars that you want to throw towards this, uh, you know, excellent um, event, definitely do that. And I think it's just so great because it's going to, the more that we have that kind of stuff, the more that we have people from, you know, from the US, from places where I think often we take for granted, like how developed our space agency is. Um, and you, you talk to some of these um, other places where they are just so excited to, to get involved in space and they don't, they don't want to miss out, you know, and that's, and I think that's the big thing is that the way that we have a sustainable future in space, is like everybody has got to have a seat at the table. Everybody's got to be there. Everybody's got to be excited about it. Um, and so I think that that's, I, I think having more events like that, and I think making sure that, um, that, you know, we're, we're just constantly thinking about and framing, okay, yes, but like, how would they, you know, 
how would how would these emerging space agencies how would they respond to sort of what it is that we're planning what it is that we're doing you know what's their perspective um and then how do we just be more respectful and more mindful and make sure that you know we are taking into consideration you know their needs and wants as well um i think that's just super important and i don't know i don't know that there's any like perfect answer right now because frankly i just think there haven't been enough conversations about it so that would be my big thing is like let's just get talking more about it and let's you know let's hear from these places let's hear from um you know the you know the african continent and like understanding like how all the all those different emerging space agencies really feel um about what it is that you know the us has planned or otherwise um and so yeah i think I think that that would, and and I think it also helps because it, it shortens the learning curve for other people too, right? And then the less learning curve there is, the less space to breathe, the less, you know, so it's like there's lots lots of advantages here to be gained. It's kind of interesting. You mentioned Artemis before, and, you know, it was based upon uh, uh, a space agency in, in Africa that, that really created the Artemis city and did the uh, transportation back and forth. I can't remember which, which African country. Was it Nigeria or? I, I think you're right. I think it was. But, you know, I read that book like three years ago. So I, I'd have to go back and check. But I think you might be right about that. I, I have to uh, mention one thing. It's, I didn't read the book, but I listened to audiobook and the narrator mm -hmm. is amazing. So it's a, probably a completely different experience if you get a chance to listen to the audiobook. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, check that out. Talking about uh, fictional books and space and urban planning, I can't help but think about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and the very the way that starts out with Arthur Dent trying to keep his house from being demolished for the building of a bypass or a freeway. Uh, I don't know if you remember uh, that. I have actually never read that book, which I feel like is is weird. Um, but yeah, like I just I it's on my list, but I don't know. I feel like everybody read that in high school and I just did not. Um, I'm kind of a like a very big nonfiction dork as well. So I do read I do read a fair amount of fiction as well. But um, yeah, if you look at like my stacks of books, it's like it's all like really um, kind of I don't know, like obscure nonfiction, <laughs> but. I think the first page of it's worth reading today. <laughs> oh, okay, cool, yeah. It, 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 the preface is, is really awesome. Um, and, and then the rest of it you can save for some, sometime you're waiting for a plane whenever we do that again. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, the vaccines are being rolled out here in Houston. Uh, my in-laws uh, signed up to get it on Monday. Uh, oh, wow. I know. That's great. Uh, yeah, I heard, I heard just um, that like they were actually had a lot of vaccine that like, and because it has an expiration date, right? Like they've got to use it. Um, so I mean, that's, that's great news. Yeah, hopefully. I know, I know that my dad's uh, actually getting it Monday. Um, so, um, and he works in pharmacy. So that's, uh, you know, I guess a, a real good thing to be you know, we definitely want all the all the pharmacists to be getting it. So, um, but yeah, so that's that's excellent. I I definitely am am hopeful. Um, you know, it was nice to wake up this morning. It's 2021. Um, of, of course, like I'm not gonna try to say that like you know I expected January one all of these problems to be gone. Um, certainly not. Uh, but it's it's just. I don't know, whatever hope we derive from just like a new digit at the end of the year, like I feel like that's powerful. So let's just, let's use it to have some renewed enthusiasm and, and whatnot. Um, Cause 2020, man, that was, uh, that was definitely a memorable year. Um, I know I've been wishing, I've been wishing people, I hope your 2021 is better than your 2019, you know, because yeah. that's just, <laughs> 2020 is a, a little higher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I hear you. I mean, it's, um, it's funny, like, I, I, you know, this is, this is so silly, but I remember, like, there was some, um, you know, just like, uh, it, it was some sweatshirt or something that I saw at the end of 2019, where it was like 2020, and it was all stylized, and um, and I was like, oh, you know, just that's a, that's a cool like lounge sweatshirt, you know, and like, oh, it's kind of fun. It's 2020. Like what a, you know, what a year. And then I am so glad that I held back on that purchase because I would probably never want to look at that thing again. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I went into 2020, just, I think like everybody else, like start of a new decade. I was so excited. And, um, it just like, it started out bad from, from the beginning, really. Um, it felt so, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely looking forward to 2021. I, I do hope though, that there's like a lot of things that we are able to do differently and just like lessons that we're able to learn. Um, because ultimately, you know, ultimately I think that like, I also was kind of, I'll be honest, I was kind of annoyed around, I think it was like May or something like that. And people were like, okay, like, here's how, like, here's what we've learned. Here's like how we're going to change that. I was like, no, like, you haven't, if you're saying that you've already like captured the whole collective experience of 2021 in May, and you think that you've learned and like, this is how we're going to pivot on it. I think a lot of people were trying to like market or even monetize like how we should, you know, think about the future differently based on just a couple of bad months at that time. And now obviously here we are in January and there was a lot more to come. Um, and so I just, I also think it's totally okay for everybody to just take like a collective, like deep breath and be like, you know what, like we, the fact that we are even here, that's enough, right? Like we will, we will work on these things. We're all tired. Um, you know, we can't let up, but at the same time, like it's also okay to like, not to not pivot into like January one being like, you know, off to the races a hundred percent, like, you know, turn the corner on the year. Like, I think that's also like unrealistic. Everybody should feel like they can just have a moment, take care of yourself, take care of your family. Um, because there's, there's a lot of work still to be done for sure. I, I do feel though that 2021 is going to be a boom year for the hospitality and travel industry. Like I, I think towards the end of this year, there's so much pent up demand just to go someplace that yeah. everybody's just going to want to go places. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Like, I know that, um, you know, I've started to think about, okay, in 2021, you know, it doesn't, doesn't feel likely that I'm going to be attending any conferences in the first half of the year, but maybe in the second half, you know, and it's kind of starting to try to think about that. Um, and then also, like, I'll be honest, it's going to feel super weird. Like, I don't know about you, but I can't even watch a movie now and like see people get close to each other and not go like, oh, wait, six feet people, you know? And so it's like, I just, I, it's going to be, it's going to be like almost relearning how to be like, you know, in close contact with people, um, which is going to be really strange. Um, but all the same, I'm excited for it. I'm excited to have that opportunity to relearn, you know, how to be, <laughs> how to be in a, in a crowded restaurant. I very much look forward to those days. So. Yeah, indeed. Well, um, when did you find out that we we're planning to go to the moon in 2024? Sorry, when did I find out what? Uh, that we were planning to send people back to the moon in 2024. Oh, mm, good question. Uh, when? I don't, I, honestly, I can't remember. I, I don't know if it was like a particularly meaningful way um, that I learned that, but I mean, I guess it just broadly speaking, um, you know, I mean, I, I feel like when I, so before I decided to do the space resources degree, I was really um, interested and in particularly um, spending a lot of time researching astronomy and actually like exoplanet research was always an area that I was really fascinated by. So um, when I got involved with the space resources program, that's honestly when my, um, when I really started getting more in tune to what was going on in terms of, um, in terms of Artemis and the moon and plans for the Mars and stuff like that. So uh, for uh, future like Mars colonies as well or cities. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I don't know. It must've been somewhere, somewhere around there. Um, but I don't know if I like recall exactly like a particular day or something I was doing. But uh, you were aware of it for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I had it. So even before the space resources program, like I, I mean, I had an interest in space um, for a little while. Um, I wouldn't say like, I feel like a lot of the people in the industry, like they've been um, focused on space since they were like little kids and stuff like that. That definitely was not, was not my um, experience at all. I was um, 
very much uh, working in like a field that like did not Right, like when you when I did architecture and urban planning in undergrad, like it doesn't touch the space industry at all. Um, it wasn't until like later that I really started doing more of a deep dive and realizing that there actually was an interesting history and overlap between the fields. Um, but that was only through like reading some like very, very specific stuff, not like your typical like undergraduate planning education. Um, and so yeah, but then I, but then I mean, like there were a lot of years there in between where even though I was working in like you know different fields, um, like finance and then real estate development, but like I still would be like reading all these articles about space on the side. Um, so you know, I think I think with Artemis in particular, I mean, obviously it's very it's very exciting. Um, I will say like the one thing though that does, and I can't remember if we've talked about this before, but the one thing that does just kind of like drive me a little bit nuts is like the whole like. Uh, first woman and next man it's like I don't know I feel like it's a little bit a little bit cheesy it's sort of like okay like we you know obviously like we want to send women to the moon that's gonna be a huge accomplishment um but at the same time it's also like probably should have already happened so it's like calling it out and like saying you know like oh like as a almost like a it feels like a marketing strategy right um just doesn't I don't know it's always kind of like kind of annoyed me but anyway that's a side note <laughs> well and i've been doing a lot of thinking about that too because i had mentioned that to a lot of people over i've been watching the interviews from a year ago that i did and i found myself saying you know the first woman and the next man you know just like uh, mike pence I, I guess was saying and you know the biggest challenge with that is after that first uh landing uh mission accomplished no mm -hmm. need to go back Mm -hmm. You know, so in terms of putting that out there as the reason to go, uh, it doesn't create that sustainable drive that you really need of, hey, we're going to go and, and start developing space resources for the betterment of humanity. Uh, mm -hmm. And this, this long sustained period of, of pushing humanity out. Um, and I, I was talking to a, a high schooler, a girl, uh, actually, uh, for an interview, and I mentioned that to her and she's like, what it's a dating show you know <laughs> it just kind of sounds like uh you know like what are they gonna do up there you know? <laughs> it's just like, yeah i didn't and that aspect of it didn't even occur to me which is why it's neat to talk to all different age groups and different people yeah. because uh, you know <laughs> you should have probably focus group that a little bit more and not with uh, uh yeah. you know middle age people you could have taken right. some um middle schoolers and high schoolers and see what they think about the first woman and the next man uh going on a little uh trip to the moon <laughs> yeah yeah it's like why not two women you know what i mean like this i mean honestly like it's so it's so interesting to me because i don't know i mean i yeah i mean you're absolutely right like i think it's perceived so differently by generation by different groups and and i think but yeah i mean my big question is like okay well why why is it like set in stone that it has to be like a woman and a man like why can't it be like two women you know why can't you know why and I think part of the problem is, is like that this is still a conversation because it's still because people ultimately know that it has not been, um, you know, a fair representation in the past. And it's just like and all the and it, it, it does, you know, we talk about how we want people to be like inspired by this stuff, like the like the, you know, the kids who witnessed like Apollo were then inspired to then go work in the space, you know, agencies and stuff like that. But I mean, it's like if we really want to be inspiring, then like, you know, let's let's like really, really make some strides to have some like, you know, representation across, you know, all different races, backgrounds, genders, that kind of stuff, you know, sexualities, like let's, let's really, um, let's like really then be like progressive in, in, in how we're thinking about this, because yeah, I mean, ultimately it's kind of like, it is always tough. Like I have obviously been like in, you know, been super inspired by like, the media that I've seen um, in terms of my own interest in wanting to go into this field. I think everybody kind of has that moment, right? Where like they watch some really great, um, you know, film or they see some TV special and they're like, oh, this is so interesting. But I will say that, um, you know, I, and, and I mean, right, like I'm a, I'm a white woman. I have a ton of privilege. I've seen, um, you know, a, a lot of, white people going to space. So it wasn't super, super hard for me to like 
extrapolate and go like, oh, well, like I could have, you know, as a kid, like me looking and being like, oh, I could have been, you know, an astronaut or something like that. Like I still recognize that like I, I have that ability to picture that for myself far more than other people do. But even still as a woman, it is difficult because you do sometimes watch these movies, you watch these documentaries and you just don't see yourself there or you don't see yourself reflected in the same way. And it is a little bit tough because you're like, man, like a lot of these firsts have already been had, you know, and then sure, there's plenty more firsts to come. Um, But again, it just like, I guess that's maybe, I don't know, as I'm talking about it, I feel like I'm like starting to understand how I actually felt about it. But like, maybe that's why this whole like first woman, next man thing kind of bothers me because it feels like in order for the first woman to get there, it still has to be accompanied by a man, you know? And so like, to me, maybe that's why, like, I'm just like, come on, let us, let us have, um, you know, this first or something like that, you know, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm obviously very, very excited about it. Very happy. It's a, you know, it's a stride in the right direction, but, uh, yeah, I'd love to see even more, um, you know, in the future. Cause I, I, I definitely think that's still a big issue, um, for NASA broadly. It's just like, it still is, is not a very, um, diverse and uh, representative like agency on the whole. And uh, you might be uh, thrilled to hear that Kathy Leaders, uh, the um, head of the Human Exploration Operations uh, Directorate of NASA, uh, made a comment about she didn't see any reason why it couldn't be two women. Oh, really? Oh, I haven't seen that. Oh, good. Okay. Well, great. Yeah, that would I mean, that would be awesome. Maybe you know, maybe that's the direction we're moving in. And, and, and look, I mean, I'm not trying to like, be like, oh, you know, men, like we can't go to space anymore. Like not at all, not at all, but it's just, um, but you know, like, yeah, I don't know. I just didn't love that marketing. I guess maybe that's it. I felt like it was kind of just like, you know, using, using, you know, uh, sending a woman to the moon is kind of like a ploy for like getting, I don't know, funding or something like, I just, I didn't love the way it was used, I guess. Yeah, and talking about employee for getting funding, um, you know, there's a lot of bipartisan support for Artemis, um, not enough to get the, the the several billion dollars we wanted for the uh, the multiple human lander uh, competition. But, um, you know, I, I think like the the head of the the Democratic Party in, in Congress, uh, Nancy Pelosi, you know, she mentioned that she's really excited to have the first woman go to the, the moon as well. But I think that also is the seed of the end of the program, because you know, again, once that social objective is made, you know, why continue to spend the money on that? Right. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, and that that kind of speaks to you know, frankly, like the whole um, you know the whole mission behind Celestial Citizen is really trying to have um, you know, if I can kind of like plug that one yeah, more time, ahead. but. <laughs> Um, but you know, because it's really, it's all about starting this kind of like, um, this platform for people to start thinking about ways in which, you know, we can sort of, um, have a connection between space and, and terrestrial matters. So how can we, you know, sort of collectively move forward, you know, earth, moon, Mars, like how can we really like push the ball forward for all of those places in a way, you know, because again, just seeing like everything everybody's doing in the space resources field and other fields, um, there's just so much progress, so much development. Um, you know, I think, I think it was even, I think maybe you and I in a, in a previous conversation had talked about, you know, water, water purification, um, you know, and, uh, and, and systems where we'd be able to, to reuse and recycle water usage. I mean, like these are, these are technologies that are, would be super beneficial to us here on earth. Um, and so I think that like, we have to frame this differently. I think you're absolutely right. I think like the trophy of, oh, we had a woman walk on the moon, like, great. And then maybe, maybe eventually down the road, people decide, oh, we're willing to fund it. So we get another trophy of like walking on, on Mars. It's like, we have to frame it differently. And I don't know, um, this might be an unpopular view, but I don't know that like the current administration did a very good job of framing this in a way that would carry like a longer term bipartisan support. I think you're right. Like there wasn't enough talk about, um, you know, about 
why we wanted to have a sustainable presence, you know, because I think a lot of people kind of, it's a head scratcher moment and they go, well, like, why does that matter? Like, we're not going to find someplace better than earth anywhere in the near future for right now, you know, debatable. I don't know. Exoplanet researchers are finding some pretty wild places, but, um, but the thing is, is that like, yeah, I think you're going to have a real hard time convincing people to like spend all this money just to survive somewhere else. So I think the big miss, missed opportunity is that people aren't talking about all the great technology that we can pull from the space industry and use here on earth. Also like just even, you know, like a lot of people are not even aware of how much NASA does, you know, in terms of like climate science and climate research as well. And, um, and how much satellite imagery helps our ability to be able to track and predict natural disasters and disease spread and things like that. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of benefit, you know, and I think it's, it's just like what we need to work on is how we can communicate those ideas in a way that is more democratic and accessible to people as opposed to, you know, we don't, if, if it takes like, if your great concept about how, you know, you're developing this technology that's going to make living in space easier. And it's also got some benefit, you know, for how people live on earth. Like if it takes a master's degree or a PhD to read that paper, like that is not enough. And I think there's some great um, programs out there. Like I was even like Astro Bytes um, is a great website where they kind of like simplify a lot of these papers. Um, and, and it's just it, making these things more readable, more accessible. I think is, is like the first step. And then once people are able to actually like, you know, get this information in, um, in a way that's digestible, then I think we open it up. We have conversations about it. You know, we, we ask, you know, we live in this like golden age of, you know, big data, which can sometimes be very nefarious, but like this big data age, like machine learning, things like that. So how can we design that in such a way that we make sure that we're doing it like ethically and that we're getting like, you know, like really truly a diverse, um, you know, sample of people and their input. But like, how, how do we use that? Like for, for good, like how can we basically, you know, find out what really matters to people, what people really care about. Um, and so I think it's, but, but it's gotta be both, right? Like you can't, if you just went out today and you started, you know, trying to mine data, like it would be very difficult to uh, support anything that you're trying to do, because I think a lot of people just aren't actually aware of some of these opportunities. So you have to first make sure that people, you know, that you're communicating your ideas in an effective manner. And then once you have that, I think once you start having conversations with people, look, like space is cool. I think everybody's gonna be really interested. And once they learn that there's opportunities in space that, you know, um, that will really benefit us here on earth, I think people are going to be really excited about that. Yeah, of course, the ultimate would be for them to have the, the vision that is just natural for them to go out into space. Well, I have one last question for you. If it was safe and affordable, uh, would you go to space? Oh, absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, I would, you know, I'll tell you this, though. I, uh, I kind of like the, uh, um, the, uh, lost in space model, right? Like, you know, cause I've, I've got three kids and, and a husband and, uh, I, and I would love to take them all with me too. Um, but, but then perhaps not get actually lost in space. Uh, but, you know, but I think, um, uh, yeah, I would, I would love to go. And, and I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely something that like um, is always kind of in the in the back burner when I'm like, you know, man, that would be great. Like what, you know, what if, um, you know, we're, we're able to retire, you know, on the moon or on Mars or something like that. Um, you know, that would just be that would be really cool. I would definitely I would definitely do it. It's um, I feel like the human experience. We're like really we're at this interesting point where like we already talk about it with the overview effect and stuff like that, where people are people are changed. People are really changed by their experience. So I would, I would personally love to experience that. Um, of course, I also think there's a lot of people who talk about one-way tickets. Um, I don't think I'd be on board for a one-way ticket just yet. I think I want to have the ability to come back to, I want to share with people, you know, what I've, what I've experienced. Um, and, uh, and yeah, but yeah, no, I would definitely, I love it. I, I would love to go into space someday. That's awesome. Well, 
Britt, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I know we had a lot to talk about and we probably could talk for days actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, I, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, actually, as I mentioned my kids, I, I think uh, I, I hear some of them now with some background noise. So um, it's probably good we're wrapping up here. But anyway, I, I really enjoyed it. It was great talking with you and thanks for having me on. Thank you. You have a good rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye.